Well, welcome to what I think is going to be a helpful, uh, in many cases, I'm going to say a reminder of some things that Chris Pedersen, our director of research for our foundation, uh, has uh, valiantly uh, offered to answer today. These actually came from a presentation we made uh, at the New York AAII chapter meeting, I believe. And uh, there were something like 50 or 60 questions. And this was the group we didn't get to. And Chris is nice enough to to, to fulfill the commitment. So uh, these are the ones I saved, Chris, that had to do with you know, the, the area that, that, that you've been responsible for, the best in class. ETF recommendations, the two funds for life, and uh, and uh, whenever I'm looking just for plain common sense, I come to you and Daryl, so that's all appreciated. By the way, I don't know if you saw the newsletter today, but there was, we have always a little testimonial in there, but was from somebody who really appreciated uh, what you have done for them uh, in educating them about the best in class uh, ETFs. And uh, it's really nice when our students, that's why I think of them as students or friends, but when they comment on uh, and say thank you for uh, the education, uh, that, that's that's a, that's a great feeling. So I've got... Well, that's, why, that's why we're here, right? We're here to help. So it's always right. good and, to hear that it actually did. And it's not just about entertainment. As a matter of fact, <laughs> if you know, it's only if it was too boring, then we probably wouldn't keep people around. But this really is all about looking for ways to make your financial uh, life better. So I've got the questions, and I know I recognize many of these uh, from the past, but I think they're good ones. Now, the first one I'm not sure we've done before, but uh, the question is, what does an investor do if a small cap value index is not available in a 401k, but they do offer a small cap blend? Uh, and how do, would that work compared to the small cap value? And by the way, another question that I didn't have on the list from that next page ask basically the same question, but they want to know about the extended market uh, a fund at Vanguard. If that were av available, uh, should that add uh, some, some return? So what say you on this uh, question of uh, reward for risk? I think the analogy that is really useful here is to imagine you're you know, you're trying to cook up your favorite curry at home and you go to the store and there's three different spices on the on the rack. There's there's strong, medium and and mild. Right. And those are your choices. And uh, they all cost about the same amount. But, you know, the strong one, you can use a little bit and it's going to go a long way. And the medium one is going to not add as much flavor in the mild, you may have to use half a box to get the flavor you want. Well, that's essentially what these three things are. The uh, the, the uh, equal weighted market index tilts a little bit to small in value, but not nearly as much. Hi, this is future editing Chris chiming in in the middle here. I realized as I'm editing this that I'm answering a different question than the one that Paul asked. He asked about using small cap blend or an extended market fund instead of small cap value in a two fund for life strategy. And what I'm answering here is using small cap blend or an equal weighted fund instead of, uh, or instead of small cap value. The reason this is important is that the extended market is everything you're left with after you take out the S&P 500. And that is actually quite a bit smaller than the equal weighted fund I'm talking about as an alternative. It is not as small as a small cap blend fund. So in a sense, the analogy I'm using is still accurate, but it is much smaller than an equal weighted fund. So I just wanted you to know that as you listen to the rest of my incorrect first answer here, 
And hopefully you're as entertained as I am watching me make mistakes. Thank you. As a uh, any of the portfolios we recommend, mm-hmm. or as much as a, uh, uh, a a small blend tilts to small. Mm-hmm. A, an easy way to think about that is the portfolios we, rec- we recommend are half and half. The amount of small that is in an equal weighted market portfolio is probably 10%. Uh, or less. It's it's not very much. So it's weak sauce. That's the way I would think of it. Small is stronger sauce than equal weighted, but it's still missing out on value. And one of the drawbacks of a small blend is that uh, we know when we look at the market overall, small small growth and blend gets you over a little bit towards growth actually has poor returns. So unless you're getting a small blend that also is filtering out the the low quality companies, you may not get much bang for your buck out of that. And that's why when we describe the two fund for life strategies, we offer up this idea that you do it in two accounts and you don't rebalance Mm -hmm. and you find your small cap value in an account outside of your 401k. And if you do that, then you get the strong sauce and you can, if you go with the best in class funds that we recommend, you can get a fund that's got exposure to the market, exposure to small, exposure to value, exposure to quality. You can get all of those things working for you. So I would seriously consider if those are my only options, investing some money outside in my small cap value to get my kicker, to get my boost. But if I can't afford to do that, if the only way I'm going to invest is for my uh, through my 401k, then the small blend is is the better choice out of small blend and equal weight. And equal weight is better than total market or uh, a uh, S and P 500 or, or growth. And when I say better, I mean in terms of long term expected return. Yeah. Any given year, who knows. So I did a, just a quick check on, uh, I looked at the dimensional small cap value fund that goes back to 1993. And so I took that and I wanted to see how did that do uh, compared to the S&P 500. Now, there was a time when I would feel that wouldn't quite be a fair comparison because you couldn't get the DFA small cap value fund unless you paid some advisor to get to it. But now that it's available as a an ETF, we can look at that history and get some sense. And just for what it's worth, um, the $10,000 invested in the S&P 500 uh, since 1993, has grown to about 194,000, and the uh, the DFA small cap value about 262,000. So that was an advantage. Now, when you actually look at the the ups and downs of these the, these different asset classes, you'll see lots of time that the S&P 500 is doing better than small cap value and and uh, and vice versa. And the same with the extended market. Now, right now, if we go back to that same starting date, the 10,000 in the extended market index was about 172,000. So that's a big difference between that and the small cap value. So, but, but, a lot of the time, that extended market index was doing better than the S and P five hundred, and 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 this is the part we have a couple of folks, maybe it's more than a couple, uh, where every once in a while they they email us and they say, "Gee, I wish I had my money somewhere else." <laughs> because yeah, what you recommend hasn't worked for me lately. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And shouldn't I be thinking about moving over in that direction? You know, it's. It's That's uh, the hardest part, I think, for especially young investors is that it's too easy to learn the wrong lessons in yes. investing because short periods of time will teach you things that aren't true over long periods of time. And it's hard to ignore. Yep. All right. Number two, 
how does one juggle the choice between investing in a higher expense ratio ETF uh, compared to a lower expense ratio uh, ETF. And he talks here about the uh, uh, Avantis uh, versus, for example, a, uh, a Vanguard that would have lower, uh, lower expenses. Uh, would the decision be as simple as going with the lower expense ratio fund? Now, before you answer that, how about, because you just mentioned this a minute ago, Thinking in terms of how would you feel about the expense? How would you feel about the book to market? How would you feel about the momentum or the quality? How would you kind of look at what would be the thing that would push you over the line in favor of one? I, you recently went through a question like this on one of your podcasts and did it in the qualitative way that I think a lot of people would be comfortable with. You went to Morningstar and you pulled up the two the two different funds you were considering and then you went to the portfolio page and looked at over on the left-hand side, there's a picture with these kind of almost like thermometers that go up and down. Yep. And you can look at that and just get a visual intuitive feeling for whether this is strong sauce or weak sauce. Am I getting smaller companies? Am I getting bigger companies? Am I getting cheaper, more value-y companies? Am I getting higher quality companies? And I think for a lot of people, that might be enough. That That's a good place to start. And if nothing else, it'll give you an idea of whether this more expensive thing is stronger sauce. Uh, now, whether it's strong enough to justify the difference in expense, now you have to get quantitative. And that's where my process that I use for selecting best in class comes in. And I've described that in multiple places many times over. There's an AIIR article on it that we can link to. And to right. do that, you have to go to Portfolio Visualizer and look at what the historical uh, premiums have been for each of these different attributes. And then you have to do a factor regression at Portfolio Visualizer, which is the way you look under the hood and you quantify these things. And it'll tell you, well, how much market exposure do you get? How much size exposure do you get? How much value? How much quality? And then you basically just multiply those out and add them together. It's it, if you're an engineer, you can kind of understand this stuff fairly intuitively quickly. But if if you're not an engineer, then um, it's that's why there are papers and presentations on it is to help somebody who wants to go through it to do it. But that's what we do in the best in class recommendations is I go through and I analyze it that way. And so if you want the ultra shortcut, you can go and look and see if those are in our list. And uh, now, what I don't do in what we publish, maybe we should someday, is quantify how big a difference there was. Uh, because when we do that analysis and we look back, I pick the one that's best, and that one is the one that we recommend. But second best, you know, it might only be uh, a quarter of a percent less expected return based on that analysis. And if you're in a position where you have a lot of gains to realize, you might want to know that. So uh, I may have just created more work for myself. <laughs> well, it wouldn't be the first time. You've done no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. <laughs> All right. Number three, how are these relative returns affected by the difference in taxes, specifically the S&P 500 in a fund that has little or no annual taxes versus a small cap value fund, which is going to be less tax efficient. What do you do about that? I start at the same place you always start, which is that we aren't tax experts. So your circumstances and situation are going to change the answer to that question for, for each individual. And that's part of the reason we don't get into it. But the other reason is we aren't tax experts. We don't study how taxes are changing every year. One thing we do know, though, is that ETFs tend to be quite a bit more tax efficient than mutual funds. 
and that when you're holding your investments in a tax deferred uh, or tax free account, you're not as concerned about these things. So those are two principles you can bring to bear on this. I think for most people, the ETF in small cap value is not going to incur a substantial tax difference over the long haul than say an S&P 500 in an ETF because the way they do the uh, exchanges and the trading within the fund ends up minimizing the amount of tax consequences for the investor. And one of the pieces of advice I got a long time ago that I think is important to keep in mind whenever you're thinking about something where it's starting to get marginal and near the limits is don't let the tax tail wag the investment dog. So I can't take credit for that quote, but it was pithy enough it stuck with me. And I think it's a good one because it's too tempting to say, well, I'm never going to incur capital gains to rebalance. I'm, you know, I'm never going to incur the tax required to rebalance. And over the long run, never get the benefits of rebalancing. Um, and so I, I, I think it's probably not the first order question that somebody should be worried about. But my gut level feeling, again, not being a tax expert, is that if it's in an ETF, this is not what you should be focused on. Well, uh, but if you wish to, uh, I, the you would expect that there would be slightly higher, even in ETFs, I think, slightly higher taxes uh, with uh, the, the value oriented because there's typically dividends there that you won't have as high a percentage in the S&P 500 generally. And uh, uh, so that is just like they say, don't put REITs in a, in, in a taxable uh, account. That should always be uh, in an IRA or a 401k. Uh, and also bonds, uh, theoretically, again, ignoring taxes uh, partly here, but that the bonds are going to be not going to be tax efficient uh, if you're talking about corporates and governments, and they are best uh, sheltered. Uh, on the other hand, there is when you have stocks that can can grow at such much, much higher returns uh, in a taxable account, you're going to get a great tax advantage cashing out there versus a taxable, a tax deferred IRA or a tax deferred 401k. And of course, I'm trying to get everybody to do a Roth 401k and and, and a Roth IRA uh, for the long term. But uh, anyway, value does tend to be a little more, uh, a little less tax efficient. Number four, uh, I like this, I like this. Given that Chris and Paul are very are way smarter and knowledgeable on investing than I am, sure buttering us up here. Yep. Uh, do either of you get tempted to invest or research an individual stock? In other words, how do you maintain the discipline to stick to the two funds or four fund combo approach using index funds uh, rather than active management? Well, when it comes to individual stocks, I think I've done a pretty good job of resisting that with the exception of employee stock purchase plans over the years. Employee stock purchase plans can be so attractive in terms of the discount that they're willing to sell you the stock at that it becomes a no-brainer that you really should probably participate. Now, there are two strategies that people take with that. One is buy and hold, and the other is, I'll call it uh, risk diversification or risk minim minimization. What's usually recommended as prudent is that since so much of your personal risk is tied up in your employer anyway, because that's where you're making your income, it's where your job security is, it's where any bonuses would be, that you should just sell as soon as you can uh, tax efficiently, but as soon as you get your rights to the money and all of the bonuses and whatever it was that were contingent on you holding on to the stock, you should just sell and diversify and reinvest it in something else. But we never did that because I, at the time I was uh, 
lazy and bullish on my company, which a lot of people are. So in that sense, yeah, I was tempted to be a stock investor. And I think a lot of people do that. Academics would say that's a mistake. Uh, once in my life, uh, my employer made that mistake clear. <laughs> you know, eventually the stock dropped dramatically and we lost, I don't know, half to two thirds of our net worth. And another time in my career, uh, it's gone very, very well. So I, you know, I, I, I am, there is a little bit of that, that um, mostly it was laziness on our part. I will say the, the second time around, having lived through once with being a stock owner and watching it drop a lot, uh, the second time around, we uh, took profits off the table. We did dollar cost uh, withdrawals, if you will, instead of dollar cost purchases, so that we got to a position where it wasn't too much of our portfolio. And we felt like we had gotten all of our money out plus a very healthy profit. And so now what we hold in that individual stock, if it goes down a lot, it's like, well, we still made a great profit on that investment. Uh, and if it goes up, well, that's just sheer dumb luck. But um, yeah, it's not something I would recommend. It just, I, I would recommend people if they have access to an employee stock purchase program to evaluate it and to consider trying to figure out how to maximize the benefit that they get out of it. But in terms of holding it for the long term, academics would say the prudent thing is to diversify out of it. Uh, so now, let me make sure, though, that you did suggest that uh, you would want them to probably hold it for a year so that when they do sell, that would be a long term capital gains, correct? There's that, yes. But I would also, you know, sometimes uh, you have to hold it for a period of time to get a company match. I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah. So, so both of those things I would consider. I would, yeah, I would try and take those into account so that I'm maximizing the benefit I get of the program. Yes. Um, the other question, there was another half of this question, which is, you know, how do you basically get all of your portfolios into a clean one of these recommended portfolios we have at the website or all of your accounts into, you know, that kind of a portfolio and, and then just leave it there patiently. And I think this is a really important question for any investor who has been in the market for a long time. On the one hand, it's nice to have things clean and neat and aligned with what you think is the right way to invest. On the other hand, the tax man cometh. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're in a brokerage account and you have a portfolio already in place and it's going to cost you a huge amount of money to change that portfolio to make it look like something else. Before I would ever do that, I would do a Morningstar x-ray of my portfolio and say, how close is it to where I'm going? How close mm -hmm. is it to what I want to have? How far off am I? How much better is that new thing going to be compared to what I have? Because if the difference is small, you may be better off just standing your ground and uh, sticking with what you've got. And so if you looked inside our various accounts, some of them are really messy because, you know, history, it yep. got us here. And the difference between an ideal, neat and tidy portfolio and what we have it's not that much. So I'm just going to live with the messiness and let it ride. And it's fine. And, uh, and they also ask about, about kind of not having fun. And uh, just for what it's worth, I, I don't do anything investment wise that is fun. Me too. I, I don't either. I, I I find investing, I find anything that involves trading not to be fun. It's anxiety producing. Yeah. And, and I don't think I have any talent at being able to select a company that's going to become a great company, particularly since the academics have taught me that the companies that haven't done so well are often the better funds, the better companies to be in, the value companies. So now I just, it's all 100% serious money, 
for the family, for Western Washington University and other charities that we care about uh, uh, eventually in our in our lives and after our lives. So I'm right there uh, with you on that, Paul. I can't pick I can't pick good companies either. <laughs> you pick good companies to work for. Uh, okay, number five. Given the longer periods with poorer returns in between the better return periods for a small cap value he's focusing on, does that mean small cap value investing should be avoided by those nearing retirement? You know, that is an entry. We've made that very clear, and I can't wait for the updated telltale charts that uh, Daryl is working on. And that telltale chart, the thing it, it, it shows us is that small cap value is, an, is great a relatively small percentage of the time when you consider how great the difference in a long-term return is. So you can't, I'm at 80. If I live another 10 years, that would be pretty doggone good for the way I've treated my body. And so it could be that small cap value wasn't going to be of any particular use to me. On the other hand, for my new granddaughter, who's a little over a year old, I guess a year and a half now, uh, having half of her money in small cap value and the other half in the S and P 500, I had, I just think that's a that's that's a a, a great answer. So so the uh, uh, the, the the challenge here, uh, I think, is what I mean. What is it the challenge for somebody now? They we're asking them to put their money, actually, we're suggesting, we're not asking, we're thinking about it, that it would be a good thing to do. What are the implications at retirement of putting small cap value or how, this person didn't say how old he or she is, I don't know that it's a he, but what do you say? Well, first, Paul, we want you to last a lot longer than 10 years. So well, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for 20 out of you. <laughs> you won't like what you're going to see, I promise. Uh, and it, it, I find your answer to this question, because I've heard you answer it before, really telling. And I think you know the numbers, yeah. but I think that your answer betrays the emotion of the mm -hmm. the response. And I think that that's what brings this question up so often too, is that as a retiree, you have trouble believing that you're gonna live that long. And you there's this instinct in us to avoid regret, to avoid making decisions that we're going to later look back on and regret. And so when we know that small cap value can underperform for long periods of time, it makes older people reluctant to invest in it. But there's, a, there's another side to that coin, and that's that if we look at the rolling one-year, five-year, 10-year, 15, 20-year periods of time, small cap value has a greater chance of delivering the higher return over each and every one of those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Small cap value has a higher chance of giving you a better return over a one-year period of time. It might only be, you know, call it 52% versus 51% or something. It's small. So intellectually, I think the data is clear. It says that, yeah, retirees should invest in small cap value to diversify their portfolio as well. And they may regret it, but the odds are they won't. The odds are actually in their favor that it'll work out well for them. But emotionally, because we do a good job of teaching about the telltale chart and teaching them that it can underperform for long periods of time, I think it and it's wise that we do. It's good people understand that. It can discourage you. It can make you think, ah, maybe I maybe I shouldn't be tilted to small cap value. But you still are, right, Paul? I mean, even at the I age am. you are, you're still tilted to small cap value, partly for you, but partly even more so for the next generation, right? Next generation. And, and the other part is so often when I'm getting a question like this, if I happen to speak with them, they are worried about putting 10 or 20 percent of their money into small cap value and thinking that that is going to be pretty risky. But 
often they're sitting on 60% of their money in equities, and that 60% is exposed to a 50% loss more than likely in their life, and they're they're worried really about the wrong thing as yes. far as I'm concerned. But but that's just the nature. You know something you yes, I do have 25% of the equities that I own are in small cap value. And and uh, and I also have 25% in small cap blend. I sometimes think I should have th- that in small cap value a- as well, but that's what I've done for 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 a very long period of time, but I brought that into my retirement, and for a lot of people that they are let's say seventy years old, and this is coming to their doorstep for the first time, and in many of those cases, people didn't get started until they were forty or fifty to invest, so it's a relatively new suggestion for them. And um, and not everybody's recommending it. I have to laugh because I don't think that 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 John Bogle ever recommended it publicly. And yet privately, he said, yeah, that's a good idea. But he did not want to have the responsibility of something that can look so different from the market that we all know and trust the S&P 500. So there you go. All right. Number six, how did you react to the March 2020 meltdown and past market downturns? And by the way, I've been there, well, you have too, where you, the market went down 22% in a day, in a day, back in October, 80, 1987. Can you share your experience with your portfolio during that time? I guess you know, we could talk about drawdown that one might suffer. And did you double down on your funds or follow a do-nothing approach? This would be to prepare myself for the inevitable crash that will occur in the future. And a lot of people are sitting there thinking that, and the minute I put the, my money in this, in this investment, the crash is coming because a lot of folks have that concern that, that the market's just waiting for them to put the money in. But ha- have you been through some really, like you, you, you watched that, that one stock that you own with a company you worked for, it was up over a hundred at one time, right? Uh, yeah, it was up about 130, I think, was the high. But uh, related to this specific question and 20, 2020, right? Yeah. Yeah. I tried to channel my dad uh, because yeah. when we had the, it was the flash crash, right? Back in the 80s. My dad and I had conversations about investing at that point in time. And he basically said, don't trade, stay calm. History says that things will recover and that trading would be the worst thing you could do. And in 2020, when the market crashed during COVID, I had those same conversations with my kids. And so I'm lucky because I come from a heritage of investors. I I, I come from, I had that culture growing up and it gives me tools that help deep down in my bones feel calm when other people are freaking out. And in terms of what I actually did personally, I looked away. I didn't actually look at my accounts probably for three months because I knew that we had enough cash to pay the bills. In fact, 2020 was a really interesting year. Most of us saw our spend rates decline dramatically because you couldn't travel, you couldn't eat out. you could. There were all kinds of expenses we would normally incur that didn't happen. And so from a cash perspective, we were very calm. We knew that we could go a long time. We had a good reserve. And I literally did not look at my accounts for three months. It wasn't until the market started to go back up that I decided to go back and look. And when I did, uh, I realized that 
we had crossed an interesting milestone. I retired in 2017. And in 2020, uh, we had less money in our accounts than when we retired, when the market dipped down. And that's yeah. always worrisome, I think. Yeah. But the thing is, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that we had gone negative in our account balances until we were positive again, because I had looked away until the, st the market started to come back up. And so that was how I dealt with it. Um, I don't know if that's wise or not, but it dealt with the emotions for us and kept us disciplined by and hold investors, which is what we want to be. Well, and to tell the rest of the story, in, in my case, uh, as I think many of our viewers and listeners know, I don't manage my right. money. And so what invariably happens when the market goes through one of these big declines is there's some rebalancing that goes on. So there is stuff going on that I can tell you I would have a very difficult time doing because I, I, I'm one of these folks that when things are going down, I picture them going down a lot further than they typically go down. And so I would have the tendency to want to wait and see if I can't do this at a, at, a, at, a, at a better time and when the market has gone down more. So I got to tell you, for, for, for in my case, I love the fact that I don't have to, to address any of those questions. They're done for me and they get done. It's interesting you mention your advisor because during that period of time, we did get a call from our broker and he, he wanted he was recommending that we do some uh, uh, trading to realize some losses mm -hmm. so that we could then use that against future gains. And that may have been prudent, but it went entirely against my instincts that I will do better emotionally to look away. So I thanked him for the the pointing out this opportunity and then ignored it. I, I mean, it was going to get in the way of my looking away. Um, and so we, I, I personally, um, I'm not a big fan of that because effectively you're just deferring taxes. You're lowering the cost basis on a future gain. Um, so I, I think in the grand scheme of things, looking away was the best thing we could have done. It kept us calm and happy. That's important that you be happy and relaxed. Yeah. Uh, what about... This is number seven. What about 50% half small cap value and 50% in the S&P 500 uh, of a target date retirement plan? In other words, instead of putting, let's say, the, the money in the target date fund, you create your own target date fund and the equity portion uh, it's going to be 50-50 S&P 500 small cap value. Now, I don't know if you happen to have access to the table that you've done that includes this, but you want to talk about that to t and, and, and address the that risk factor compared to a regular target date fund uh, so that people will get a sense well, let's let's keep it simple and uh, okay. let and just go through the thought process of how you would figure this out. In the past, Paul, with your fine tuning tables, you've pointed out that with every ten percent that you add, you lose about a half, ten percent in bonds that you uh, add. You lose about a half a percent in expected return, right? And what we're comparing here is a portfolio that is. I'm assuming this is for a young person. So the portfolio that is half in a target date fund and half in small cap value has a 5% allocation to bonds if it's a Vanguard-like target mm -hmm. date fund mm -hmm. because a Vanguard target date fund in the early years has 10% in bonds. Mm -hmm. And if it's only half of the portfolio, that takes it down to 5%. So now we're talking about instead of a, losing a half a percent of expected return to the bonds, you're only losing a quarter of a percent. 0.25% difference. So I think you can just kind of use that thought process and mm -hmm. you can talk yourself into, well, would I like another quarter of a percent return? 
And am I willing to manage my own glide path to do that? Mm-hmm. And if so, sure, go for it. Um, but I wouldn't expect the return to be, you know, much more than that. It's probably going to be on the order of a quarter percent. Now, the other way you could come at this is you could say, well, if I want another quarter of a percent return, what if I did 60% in small cap value and 40% in the target date fund? And that would probably more than compensate for the bonds. You might even be able to get there with 55% and 45%. So you have multiple ways to get there. Uh, It's not, we're talking about things at the margin. It's not a big difference. Well, let me, but there's something that I think I've, uh, I'm trying to figure out. If they're going 50 50 uh, small cap value target date fund, if they're doing that, yes, they are benefiting a quarter of 1% on reducing the exposure to fixed income, but they've also just over, they've added all that small cap value. So, I mean, there are two things, big things that are going to happen. What you're saying is the difference between doing it yourself and adding the quarter of a percent, uh, they're already going to have picked up a whole bunch of extra return, theoretically, by having added all that small cap value and some more because of you've minimized the exposure to fixed income, right? Yeah, I'm assuming that the two portfolios we're comparing are half target date fund and half small cap value versus half S&P 500 and half small cap value. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. If that's what we're comparing, then yeah, the difference is likely to be the half of the half, (laughs) you know, the, the, so it's about a quarter percent. It's not that much. And, uh, I think the convenience of having somebody else rebalancing your portfolio, managing your global diversification, managing your glide path unemotionally, if that's the path that you think you want in the future, having somebody else do that for you for, especially if you can get a Vanguard fund at Mm 0.08%, that is a slam dunk bargain Mm -hmm. because the part that you don't, understand, I think, especially as a young person, is how you're going to feel when your account balance is worth a million or $2 million and you're nearing retirement and you have to go in there and you have to sell hundreds of thousands of dollars or $100,000 plus of one thing to buy a different thing to rebalance. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of opportunity to second guess and to rebalance internationally and versus US. Taking all that emotion out of it, I think is worth way more than 0.08%. Well, and it's possible that if somebody starts that process when they're in their 20s and they have very little money in it, that by the time they're in their 30s and their 40s, they're going to have the process down. Now, I think I think there's a point where some people panic. Oh, my God. I'm managing a million dollars, and what if I screw it up? And they're worried. They want somebody else to take responsibility for that. And the reality is, I mean, this is like the person who may have no problem walking across a two-by-four between two pumice blocks, uh, like like at the circus, (laughs) if you will, versus doing it between two buildings, Eight stories up. I mean, it's a it's the same two by four theoretically, but it changes the emotion of it. So a good uh, analogy. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, let's see. Or if you have, well, I've got a couple of them that go together here. If you have a very diversified portfolio with stocks and bonds and funds and decide to move to the two fund strategy, what would be the best way to transition to the two fund strategy? And also there's another, probably came from the same person, for the two fund approach, is it appropriate to move your portfolio all at once or when you are close to retirement? In this particular case, this person said at age 63, but, but this, 
building the new portfolio, what what are the steps you recommend? I I would first of all consider taxes. So if it's in a tax deferred account, uh, you can go without worrying too much about taxes. Uh, it's not going to be a factor. If you're in a taxable account, I would definitely look at what the tax implications are going to be of changing and try to figure out if there is a way to reduce those by spreading out the trades over time. So that would be the first thing I would think about. But the second piece, and this is probably actually the more important piece behind the question is the emotional side. Uh, people sometimes, again, don't want, they don't want to regret something. They don't want to trade at the wrong time. Personally, yeah. I find that regret avoidance is overrated because I never go back and check how I would have done in what I traded out of. Right. I, I never do that. And I think the vast majority of people don't. So I, I think that you can change all at once or you can change over time. But I would definitely, especially since these are questions of people that are mid-career or you know farther along, they already have a portfolio. They've been investing for a while. I would definitely consider the taxes before I changed and maybe even talk to your tax accountant about it and figure out if there's a way to do it that uh, spreads it out. You know, you get a certain amount of capital gains free every year. Maybe that's the way you do it. You know, you realize, it's especially, I mean, one advantage while you're working is you're probably not realizing capital gains. And so you can, you know, realize a certain amount this year tax free and that amount next year tax free and an amount the next year tax free. Once you're a retiree, if your dividends aren't sufficient, you're probably realizing capital gains every year and it gets harder to have as much of a flexible lever. So that would be my thoughts. So what I have what I have noted over the years is that a lot of people look at this point of retirement as some huge change that gives them a point that they reconsider everything. So somebody might be 60% in equities and 40% in fixed income in their 401k, and they're moving over to a new account that's going to be, whether it's managed by somebody else or they're doing it themselves. The fact is, in my mind, if that 60-40 was the, that, if that was the right combination, then there's no reason to dollar cost average and you should be 60-40. On the other hand, one of the things that's going to happen probably is when you move from wherever you are into the two fund portfolio, uh, it's going to require maybe rethinking how much you have in fixed income. Because w when you do put together small cap value and a target date fund, it may create a, a, an exposure to more exposure to equities than you want. And yeah. So that's you, you, yeah. And it's not that hard to figure out how much you're going to have in fixed income when you do that change. The fact that target date funds are so conservative uh, means probably a lot of people, you know, approaching retirement and into retirement would be able to tolerate some added small cap value and still be in a reasonable fixed income allocation. I really liked your comment about how people approaching retirement tend to think about changing or rejiggering or, or because I just watched that with a friend of mine mm -hmm. and they went through this kind of an analysis of, you know, it, I've had this aggressive portfolio that got me here. Can I live with that aggressive portfolio in retirement or does it need to be a heck of a lot more conservative? And I, we did that. I mean, we worked with an advisor approaching retirement because for the first time in our lives, we felt like our knowledge about investing was insufficient to, to really rely on it for our retirement. Yeah. Well, um, I'm doing a, a presentation at Retire Meet on yep. February 24th. And uh, my topic for a half an hour is when is enough enough? And this dealing with the, the idea of enough is a really big deal in everybody's life, whether it's enough education, enough money, enough food. I mean, it's, it, 
it is a part of the decision making process that I find fascinating, and and a lot of people don't even have a a, a, a specific commitment to a particular goal as an investor to guide them to help figure out what is enough, and so um, I and and like you say or I said. This point at going into retirement seems to be the point that people are willing to be thinking about what is enough, enough risk, enough money to, 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 to underwrite your lifestyle. And will we get to watch that presentation on the YouTube channel or listen to it on your podcast? Yes, we will. Okay. People can attend. They set it up. For people online, they they're booked full for live. It's going to be great fun for me because I number one I get to go there and make the presentation to three hundred people live. I love that opportunity. But then as soon as I get done there, Tom Cock and I have lunch together, except we're not eating, uh, and we're doing a Q and A for forty five minutes. Oh, what fun! Now, it's what going fun. to be fun. And I will tell you that for people who do attend. Uh, Weston Wellington from DFA is going to be presenting. I don't know what his presentation will be, but I can tell you that when I first in the in the mid '90s, early '90s, I was exposed to to uh, DFA and all that they had to offer in terms of research and 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 dealing with the emotions of of investing. Weston Wellington's presentation was the one I remember so vividly. He's a great presenter, and uh, and I think it's going to be great fun to see him. So it costs you $5 to go, and Tom and his firm, they're giving that $5 to, to not to our foundation, but to some other educational foundations that help high school students. So so financial education foundations and organizations, which is great. So it costs five dollars, and uh, I told him, I said, "Why did you do that? It just makes the decision process that much harder for people." Anyway, that's the way it is, and, and uh, hope to see you there. Okay, number nine. Both presentations were excellent. Well. The reason that this person is saying that is because Chris and I each made what a forty-five minute presentation was it? About Chris? yep. And um, uh, this was again the AAII a chapter. Uh, it says, Chris, is there anything about your process to select best-in-class ETFs on your website? Uh, the reason I ask is I was unable to follow your process due to lack of knowledge on my part. He, he didn't understand all the terms. So give it up. Don't, I don't, we don't want the 45 minute piece. What I'd like to do is where on the website would you send people? And then I might even add something to that when you're done. Well, as you know, the website has been evolving a little bit. So I can't honestly quickly tell you where it is, but let's put links in the show notes. And I believe we'll be able to put links in there for two things. There is a video that I did where I walked through how to do it. Um, although the present the AAII presentation includes that. So we should probably point to that. And then there's the AAII article that I wrote and uh, we can point to that. So uh, let's pull up, we'll, we'll put in the show notes, a couple of links. Uh, it, it's something I've talked about at least three times, if not no. four. No. And uh, I think it is something that if you're mathematically inclined, is not that difficult. And if you're not mathematically inclined, uh, again, there is the Morningstar option. You can go to Morningstar and you can do the qualitative analysis that a lot of people do at the grocery store when they look at the nutrition stuff on the side of the package. It's like, do I want the one that has all of the saturated fat or the one that has the not saturated fat, right? It's, it's that kind of stuff. So. so another way I think that could be done, and we'll, we'll have the AAII article link, and uh, uh, I think the 
resolution on that AAII presentation, when they reproduced it, for some reason didn't come out very sharp. So it's not as easy to see the numbers. Uh, I had high hopes we were going to be able to use those presentations. But um, anyway, if you go to boot camp on the home page, there's going to be best in class ETF. That is a place where you click on that and you get not only the video that you and I did together, that other than the AAII, by the way, you get a, in a podcast, you get an article, and uh, you get links to all the stuff that you've done on the website. And I think it does a pretty good job of uh, of getting people where they need to be if they just go to boot. We're going to have those links as you've promised. But so here, here you go. You're 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 asking me a question, and you already know the answer. Your answer is way better. You know, the, some teachers are wicked that way, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, but that's way better. <laughs> that is one way. Okay, uh, let's look at uh, number ten, Chris, for a fifty. 50 small cap value tax, I mean, the target date fund. How does international small cap value help or hurt the returns in the small cap value part of the portfolio? This is a tough question to really answer definitively because we don't have international history on small cap value going back a long time. And when I say a long time, I mean like 1928. We we have international going back into the 90s, I believe, on small cap value. Uh, does that sound right to you, Paul? I think you can go back uh, further than that. They've, there's some Japanese returns and, and UK returns that I know that- uh, But not, not international, not the full, yeah. developed, yeah. yeah. And so that makes this question difficult to answer. And uh, it also makes it, uh, Professor Cedarberg recently did a presentation on the Rational Reminder podcast where this is the one where he was talking about how an all equity portfolio is safer uh, for a, a lifetime investor, even through retirement, when you look at not running out of money. And one of... The things that he pointed out in that presentation is that when we use U.S. only data, in a sense, there's a survivorship bias in that data because we're we're looking at the country that if it wasn't the best, it was one of the top three yeah. Yeah. for the last hundred years. And so in his analysis, not for small cap value, but for the market overall, he said, you know, the U.S. is a developed country. It's not a separate entity or different kind of thing. It is a developed country. And if you look at investing across all developed countries, there's a lot more risk than there is in the U.S. alone. So if you take out that survivorship bias, you see a, a different picture. And what that argues for then is investing not in any one country, not in the U.S. only, not in France only, not in Germany only, not in UK only, but investing in all of them, because then you take out this idiosyncratic risk. So when I think of this question, I think of insurance. You can invest all of your money in the US small cap value market and get some tangible advantages. The market's efficient, it's low cost, it's widely available to us, right? There's all these advantages. But there is a disadvantage, and that's that you are exposed to idiosyncratic risk of the U.S. market, and you're not compensated for that. Yeah. So if instead you invest in the U.S. market and the ex-U.S. market small cap value, you now get an expected return that theoretically, according to the academics, is pretty close to the same, if not the same. Um, I'm just going to stick with pretty close to the same. And you get rid of that idiosyncratic risk. You're you're safer. So the bottom line is I can't tell you how much difference there would be because I don't have enough data. But I can tell you that when you invest only in one market, 
you are taking some risk that you're not getting compensated for. And if you invest in a more broadly diversified portfolio, you're getting rid of some of that risk and picking up um, something comparable in terms of return. So in our own investing, we, you know, we try and figure out how much international are we comfortable with and then diversify that amount. And I'm balanced between U.S. and international 50-50, and we do tables of 70-30 U.S. to international and 50-50, so people can see the difference. There is, looking at past results is such a tricky business because yeah. when we look at the, like you say, there the results and the studies we've done, they come out to be comparable returns, but the reality is, is that in the 70s, for example, there is small there is, there is some small cap value that can 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 be tracked and 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 you've done some work in the rhyme and regress arena to try to create some something that looks reasonable. But we have to remember that a lot of that was the Japanese market in this period that it exploded. I mean it. It went sky high. It went to when we think about the uh, how expensive companies got in the U.S. in the before the tech wreck. It was twice as big as that. PE ratios were just unbelievable levels. So you could say, well, wait a minute, are we going to count on Japan having another great period like that? And I think, no. And yet they're built. They are cooked into the returns. Just like 95 through 99 for the S&P 500 is baked into the returns, a, a five-year period that the S&P 500 compounds at 28.5% or something. Unheard of, but it's in there. And can we expect that to happen again? Or yeah, can we expect, go ahead. I, one of the other things Professor Cedarberg pointed out that, I hadn't seen quantified somewhere else that was really interesting is that on a day-to-day, month-to-month, year-to-year basis, the U.S. market, international developed are more correlated, considerably more correlated in terms of their ups and downs than on a decade or multi-decade basis. Mm -hmm. And you can see this in the, um, there's a chart in my book where I show what share of the worldwide market the different countries are over time. And there's long periods of time where they kind of track. They're they're not that different from one another. Mm -hmm. And then in short periods of time, they change dramatically. And that makes this analysis hard too, because it means that, you know, you look back over the last five years or 10 years and you go, oh, the U.S. market crushed it. You know, I should be all U.S., But that's not the way the long-term trends work. The long-term trends tend to be almost the opposite of that. It's whatever's been doing well lately is the thing that underperforms next. And that's just really hard to intuit and get down in your core. Yeah. I am curious, Chris, you didn't make a comment to me about uh, a a stand I took in my last, our last podcast. When I, um, I think it's been released anyway, where I challenge something that we have heard a thousand times in our careers, and that is that past results, returns, are not indicative of future results. You cannot count on them. I have actually taken a different position on this. It came in the middle of the night to me. The fact is, I believe future returns are going to be absolutely like past returns. One, they're not going to be predictable. They're going to be all over the place. Everything that we show when you we do all these tables, it picks up all this stuff that is never going to happen again the same way. And yet the returns are going to be up and down that's what's that's what's going to be the same. And nobody's going to know how they're going to roll out. The sequence of returns will not be the same. Just as the sequence of returns were not predictable before. It's all the same story. 
And it's sometimes hard to then say, oh, my God, I don't know if I the bank is sounding a lot better. I can count on them. Yeah, you can. And, of course, inflation takes most everything they give you. And over the long term, this very unpredictable series of things that are going to happen to us turn out to be pretty good for people. But it's going to be the same crazy ride in the future. And, and, and this is the challenge of buy and hold investors is how do you act with conviction yep. in the face of uncertainty? Yes. Because your future is uncertain. It's not guaranteed. Yep. Uh, but I think the conviction comes from understanding that the odds are tilted in your favor. And that's really what we're looking for is picking something where the odds are tilted in your favor that you can stick with. And there is no perfect solution, but when you find one that you can stick with, yeah. that's good enough. Stick with that. Well, yeah. I've got one I want to suggest right now. It's number 11. It's not on the page that you have. So, uh, and I know it's one that you, you'll have some fun with. I've looked at DFA and Avantis. And it makes me want to break break out in song. I've looked at both sides now, okay? <laughs> and here's what I know. Both Avantis and DFA are groups of people of very smart, dedicated people trying to figure every little way they can turn out a better return. And somebody made the suggestion. You know, they're... They're both so good, and they were both working so hard. But when you look at their portfolios, they are not the same portfolios. This is not like buying the S&P 500 at Fidelity and at Vanguard. No, these are different portfolios, different levels of momentum, different levels of quality, different numbers. One has way more than the other. Anyway, differences. But What's wrong with owning both of those small cap value ETFs? Anything wrong with that? Nothing. Nothing wrong with that at all. And it's uh, probably normal human behavior, right? You'd rather not have all your eggs in one basket. So having both lets you rely on the process and uh, the financial security of both companies. Uh, if either one has any small challenges, it reduces the amount of risk you have in that. I, I think both are very safe investments from the standpoint of your assets being protected. Oh, yeah. As of the way the U.S. Uh, securities markets are regulated. If you feel more comfortable because you have the systems and the processes of these two well-intentioned, academically grounded institutions working for you, why not? Yeah, that's great. Last question for today. Uh, you've talked. Uh, in fact, I've seen the rough draft of your new white paper on uh, on the two funds for life. Uh, and I, um, well, uh, two funds for life, short and sweet. Right. Yes. Okay. How are you coming on that? What's the what's the estimated time of arrival? Well, the one of the pieces of feedback I got from Daryl was that it wasn't short enough and it wasn't sweet enough. <laughs> I, and I thought because it's probably like a three thousand, you know, fifteen hundred word to three thousand word article if you count all the Q and A. It's probably fifteen hundred words. And I thought, you know, you take a book that's 30,000 words and you distill it down to 1,500. That's pretty good. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I've had another reviewer tell me that it made good sense to them and they really liked the Q&A. Yeah. But I think everybody who I've talked to about it agrees that it would be better if the very first thing somebody sees when they come to our website on Two Funds for Life is more like sound bites, is is more like a um, an infographic. So oh. that's what I'm working on is trying to figure out how to get it down to an infographic starting point. And then this Two Funds for Life short and sweet will be the kind of the mezzanine level. It's for somebody who clicks to learn more. 
And for somebody who wants the owner's manual, the deep dive, we've got the book. So it's kind of a nested Russian doll exercise and I'm having fun with it. I think I have managed in some of the presentations we've done to do a pretty good job on the soundbite level. So my hope is we can get there and before the year is out, update our web content so that people can uh, take the dose that they're up for. You know, I think that we are doing um, an AAII presentation um, for for Orange County um, and a New York, uh, which I think the the two of them include your presentation and mine. Uh, so that will be an opportunity uh, to you know, really fine tune that in terms of the video, if, if that, if that works for you. Anyway, thanks. Now, you, you know, I don't know how long have we been talking? I have no idea. Uh, yeah, I don't know either, but my hope is that edits to something reasonable or that people don't mind pausing and listening <laughs> to it over a couple of listening sessions. So I enjoyed this. This is fun. I always like getting together with you, Paul, and I love the questions. I love how much I learn from our listeners through yeah. what they ask and how they challenge us. So you're saying keep them coming, folks? Please. Please. <laughs> thank you, Chris. And thank you, all of you out there who are kind enough to spend uh, time with us. Uh, I'll never forget the, uh, uh, the video I got of uh, somebody hiking through uh, South, America, South American jungles somewhere while he was listening to our podcast. And uh, it is it is really cool to think that uh, our information might be helping other people have uh, a better financial life. And uh, we're going to keep doing it and you're going to keep helping us, I hope. Thank you and good luck. Thanks, Chris.